David Sauerman of the Walkative Lecture Series. It's named after Dave Sauerman, who was a professor here for many years. Fantastic lecture, uh, great uh, microeconomist. And so each time we do this, it gives me a chance to step back and appreciate him even more. Um, so I hope you enjoy this lecture uh, tonight. Um, we uh, use these lectures as a way of encouraging, challenging ideas and uh, critical thinking, and I hope you'll accept it as that. Enjoy yourself. Um, David Hart is with us uh, tonight. We're very fortunate to have David come and speak with us. Um, he'll be talking about uh, Friedrich uh, Bastia, and uh, we will um, let him uh, talk uh, at length about this fascinating um, economic journalist, a uh, critical thinker from the early uh, 18th, I'm sorry, early 19th century. Um, David Hart is the director of the Online Library of Liberty Project at Liberty Fund in Indianapolis. Many of you may have heard of Liberty Fund, a fantastic organization. Um, the uh, online library has won numerous awards since uh, he uh, came there in 2001 and went online with the library in 2004 including the best of the humanities on the web from the National Endowment for Humanities in 2006. David received his PhD in history from King's College in Cambridge and taught for 15 years in the Department of History at the University of Adelaide in South Australia, where he was awarded the University Teaching Prize. Uh, he's worked at the Institute for Humane Studies, where he's the founding editor of the Humane Studies Review. Um, so please welcome Professor Hart as he discusses the life of a fascinating uh, politician, journalist, and constant critic of economic protectionism, Frédéric Bastia. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Lydia, and the Department of Economics for inviting me to talk to you this evening. Uh, my topic is Frédéric Bastia, campaigner for free trade, a political economist and a politician in the time of revolution. And this is the 1848 revolution we're talking about. Now, you might find it strange that I'm talking about yet another dead white male, <laughs> but he really is a fascinating um, figure for a number of reasons, and I'll explain why I think he's an important figure in just a moment. We can see here him in his sort of ceremonial um, coat with his uh, medallion <clears throat> ribbon on his chest to, to suggest that he looked to show that he was a, a member of the Chamber of Deputies in France in um, 1848 and 1849. Here is a statue of him, a, a memorial that was built by his friends and colleagues in 1878 in the small town of Mougrand in uh, southwestern France. And uh, when his, the bicentennial of his birth occurred, he was born in 1801. So in 2001, there was a big uh, conference in uh, Mougrand to celebrate the 200th anniversary of his birth. And the people, the citizens of Mugron had never heard of Bastiat. They thought he was just a, an object that the pigeon sat on. Um, <laughs> And so they were very puzzled because there are so many Americans there, which is quite interesting. Why do Americans have more interest in Bastiat than um, they do French people? Um, anyway, um, from that meeting in 2001 came a decision to translate and publish by Liberty Fund the complete works of Frederick Bastiat, uh, which had never been done before. And I'm happy to announce that the first volume of their six-volume series came out last month. This is his correspondence. And I'm the academic editor for this project, so... I probably know more than I need to know about Bastiat by now. <laughs> if you want to uh, find out more about Bastiat, more about what I was saying to this evening in this lecture, please go to my homepage, .mac.com, dmhart, and the, uh, all this overhead material will be available and lots and lots of other stuff. If you want to see what we have on the online library of Liberty at uh, Liberty Fund, go to ol.libertyfund.org, person number 25. <coughs> That's Bastiat. So he was uh, put online very early in our project. Now that I should uh, explain to you why I think Bastia uh, is important, and I thought of a number of reasons, and I'll just uh, share some of those thoughts with you. He was a fervent advocate of individual political and economic liberty in a society which did not value these things very much at all. So he was uh, an outsider. He was a humble and shy man who did what he thought was right, and he didn't know how much he knew and how good he was at what he did. So his success, which finally came in 1844, surprised him. He was a brilliant economic journalist and popularizer of economic thought, but he was also capable of writing serious academic papers which showed very deep insights. 
The modern Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek called him a genius at economic journalism. But I think that doesn't say enough. I think that had he lived longer than 49 years, he died in 1850 from throat cancer, which was extremely painful and made it very difficult for him to work and write in the last two years of his life. He was in the middle of writing a theoretical treatise on economics when he was uh, finally taken away on Christmas Eve, 1850 in Rome. So we don't know exactly what he would have produced had he lived just a little bit longer to finish his magnum opus. But I think the signs were there that he was a serious theorist of world ranking. He was also a man of wit and humour who developed a very personal style in which, with which to defend liberty. And I call this a rhetoric of liberty. He had a whole range of devices which he used to try and make economic ideas better understood by the ordinary person. And also some of his colleagues who were economists who didn't share his views on certain matters. Uh, he was very good at uh, rhetoric of writing um, persuasive articles. For example, he used sarcasm, parody, puns, literary references to make economics less dull and dry. He was terribly concerned that the reason why people turned off economics was because they thought it was boring. I'm sure none of you have ever thought of that in your life. <laughs> but um, let me tell you that economics can be fun and interesting. And I want to show you some examples of how Bastia made the, the study of economic ideas uh, quite amusing and sometimes even hysterically funny. One of his techniques in his rhetoric of liberty was to use what's, what he called the sting of ridicule. And he used this to excellent effect in exposing the follies of those in power, those who had privilege and those who had access to getting favourable legislation passed uh, to increase their uh, profits. He was also a, courage, a very courageous and determined man who continued to fight for what he believed in in spite of innumerable setbacks that he, he suffered. For example, he was very uh, involved in the French, or trying to build a French free trade movement. He would, had been um, influenced by the work of Richard Cobden in England, who formed the anti corn Law League in the late 1830s, and was able to persuade Parliament in 1846 to abolish, um, uh, substantially abolish the uh, restrictions on trade, especially for corn, which was their word for wheat. Um, and Bastia wanted to try something similar in France. And he tried building one in Bordeaux, which was close to where he lived, and then to build one in um, Paris. And uh, the French people were completely indifferent uh, to his pleas to, for free trade. And then when the French Chamber of Commerce debated a free trade um, piece of legislation in 1847, the free traders were defeated. So that was one of his setbacks. Another setback was he was... Uh, um, uh, in Paris at the time of the Revolution of 1848, and he became a deputy in the Chamber of Deputies, and had uh, two major sources of criticism and opposition. From the left, there were socialists who wanted to introduce a kind of a primitive form of the welfare state in France, and he was opposed to that on economic grounds and also on the grounds of justice. On the right, he had the party of order. This was the, the people who supported the old monarchy, and who, who, were, who also supported protectionism. And so he was caught in between these two... Uh, uh, opposing uh, camps, and his struggle was a, a very uh, difficult one. He also was interesting because he took to the streets in Paris during the revolution. He's a hands-on revolutionary who was in the streets of Paris, either handing out leaflets to the workers to try to persuade them not to be seduced by socialist ideas. He was also on the streets trying to stop the troops from massacring the, the uh, rioting uh, protesters. He thought that the, the troops had no right to uh, kill people who were just expressing their opinions. And so we have letters and, and other uh, stories about how um, Bastiat was out in the streets, literally putting his body between the troops with the guns and the protesting workers on the other side to try and stop the troops from shooting the workers. And dozens and dozens of workers were shot in the June days of 1848 when this uprising took place. In fact, he was uh, active in uh, pulling people to safety and removing dead bodies off the streets of Paris. He did all this when he had a throat condition, which we think is uh, cancer of the esophagus, which was making it very difficult, if not impossible, for him to speak in the chamber of deputies and to continue working because of the pain. Uh, we think he was on um, a kind of laudanum, which was a, an opium derivative um, to try and uh, keep the pain at bay. The other interesting thing about Bastiat is his uh, ability to combine all sorts of activities. Uh, any one of these things might have been enough for one person. He was a single-issue agitator for free trade. He was an economic journalist whose, whose uh, motive was to debunk 
the misperceptions that pe and misunderstandings people had about how the economy functioned. And he called these sophisms. And so some of his writings are called economic sophisms, which he, in which he tried, had these little short stories and parables and dialogues and uh, witty tales to try and um, overcome people's misunderstanding and ignorance of economics. So he was a brilliant uh, journalist in, in this form. As I said, he was a member of the Chamber of Deputies, so he was a politician. And um, in, when he was, he was elected twice to office to represent the southwestern part of France, where he was from. And he served as vice president on the finance committee. And uh, he was like Mr. No, right, saying, no, you can't do this. We don't have enough money. This is too much of a ta heavy taxation. Um, but the, uh, the parliamentarians, of course, just ignored him and went about uh, their efforts to bankrupt the French state. <laughs> He was trying to write a major theoretical treatise called Economic Harmonies at the time he died. And he, given, he started giving lectures at the School of Law in 1847. Um, and this was going to turn into the book of his major theoretical treatise. And economists like him found it very difficult in France to lecture on economics because there was no department of economics in the universities. So they had to do it elsewhere, um, usually in the department of law, uh, the law schools. Um, and of course, what the government did to try and keep the free trade political economists from lecturing was to say, well, you can only do it in the law school and you can only teach economics if you have a law degree. This is like a catch-22. And so the only people teaching economics in France were lawyers who tended to be bureaucrats or ex-bureaucrats or would-be bureaucrats who had no great sympathy for the free market. He also claimed to write a history of plunder. It was one of his great interests, was how people got together to steal money on a regular basis from other people. This is what he called plunder. And he planned this work and he had a sketch and outline, but he never got around to, to writing. But this man was able to combine all these things into one person. And uh, it's amazing that um, he was a virtual unknown until 1844. And in the six years between 1844 and um, 1850, he wrote six big volumes like this of economic writings. Quite extraordinary. The man has energy and I think that's admirable. I just want to say something very brief about his place in the history of economic thought. Um, what you have to realise, I think, is that they were combating um, a number of uh, contending schools of thinking about how the economy works. We have, um, from the 17th and 18th century, a school of thought known as mercantilism. And the idea behind this was the state had an army, it had colonies, um, it had favoured industries, and you had to have taxation to support your armies and to pay for your colonies. You had to have a protected industry because you couldn't uh, fight a war in the colonies or in the empire if you had, uh, had to import uh, material on, uh, in free trade from other countries, so you had to manufacture them yourself. You had to have um, taxes on imports and exports, um, taxes on other goods and services to run uh, the mercantilist system. Now, in the late 18th century, there were two traditions which rebelled against this mercantilist notion of economics. In the Anglo-Scottish school, you have Adam Smith writing in 1776 and creating the classical school, which was direct um, opposition to the mercantilist school. Also in France, you have the economists. Now, the, I love this because the French, being the French, are so arrogant, um, they call themselves the economists because there could be no other economist apart from a free trader. Right? The, um, the economists in France didn't need an adjective to describe what kind of economists they were. So they just called themselves the economists. So you have these two strains of thinking about free markets and free trade until about the 1830s or 40s when socialism began to emerge as an organised body of, of doctrine, both in France and Germany. And so what Bastiat is doing in the 1840s is opposing the remnants of mercantilism on one side and also the rising socialism uh, both in France and Germany uh, on the other. He was also trying to enrich and deepen the classical school's notion of things like rent or, or whatever and to sort of um, in, um, improve that uh, tradition. So these are the sort of... Other, in, in the late 18th, 19th century we have the emergence of neoclassicism and then the marginal school of the, the Austrian economists appearing in the 1870s and onwards. So you have these streams of thought. Now I, you'll notice here that the French school practically dies out in 1940. And the major um, economic journal of the free market, School of Economics in France, was known as the Journal des Economistes, the Journal of the Economists, <laughs> and our French arrogance again. Well, they were destroyed by the invasion of Paris by the Nazis. Their entire infrastructure, their publishing efforts and so on were destroyed. 
and um, that put an end to it. So when you now talk to French uh, economists, they usually have studied, um, if they are free market at all, they've studied in, in America, LA, or uh, Chicago, or some other place. But America has always been interesting because the interest in Bastia has been much stronger here than in France. And there are a couple of reasons for this. There were some followers of Bastia in the late 19th century in America. There was a Bastia school. Um, we also have people like Leonard Reed and Henry Hazlitt in, in the years immediately after World War II who rediscovered Bastia's writings. And Leonard Reed and the Freed and Foundation for Economic Education translated some of his works in the, 18, in the 1960s, um, which have been in print ever since. And so it's relatively easy for Americans to have access to his material. Um, Ronald Reagan also is interesting because he said that one of his, um, one of the most influential people on his thinking about economics was Bastiat. Although I think it affected his thinking rather than his actions, but um, <laughs> that's a controversial uh, matter. And then of course you have the modern libertarian movement who has always had an interest in Bastiat for both his political and for his economic uh, thought. Let me just give you some brief background of where he comes from. Uh, of course, you go to Google Maps, you know, and to find out where these things are. Mougron is this small town in a wine growing district in southwestern France. Uh, his family were merchants, so his family was integrated into world trade, um, so they were sympathetic to uh, trading and as, as an honourable occupation. Um, they're close to the Spanish border, which means that um, Frederick Bastia could see free trade in operation. And of course, then it was called smuggling, but smuggling really is free trade in operation. <laughs> and there was constant smuggling and moving of people back and forth across the border. Because he came from this provincial area of France, he spoke with a funny accent, much like mine. Uh, it big funny to you, but similar to that. Um, so when he went to Paris as a successful economics writer, they sort of looked down on him as this country bumpkin who had uh, uh, less sophisticated clothes and spoke with a provincial accent until they started reading his writings. And they suddenly said, oh my goodness, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And they eventually overcame their prejudices against someone from the provinces and welcomed him with open arms into the Parisian, uh, the high Parisian circles of the political economy. He inherited his grandfather's uh, estate when his grandfather died and became a gentleman farmer in this small town of Ougrand in southwestern France. And then um, he tried uh, a number of times to get elected to office and failed. What he did was, apart from his experimental work with his farm, he read for 20 years. Now, to me, this seems like an ideal situation. Right? He spoke Spanish, Italian, English, and of course French. He also knew some Basque because some of the maids and servants they had in the house, because of, they were in this, uh, close to the Basque region here, spoke Basque and he was very interested in that. But he spent 20 years reading economics in all these four languages. Um, which was a, that's a wonderful foundation. I mean, imagine um, a graduate student taking 20 years to prepare for your finals. You'd expect to know something by the end of those 20 years. <laughs> so he spends reading, he's involved briefly in the July Revolution of 1830. He becomes elected, appointed a justice of the peace, so he's a minor magistrate, and he gets a reputation for the speedy settlement of commercial disputes. Because he knew coming from a business down in New York was to have these legal problems solved and um, to move on. He discovers the, the, the anti corn Law League in England and begins to read about them and suddenly decides that this is something he wants to see created in France. So he begins writing small articles for the local press and eventually he puts it all together into a major research paper which he has published in the Journal des Economies. This is the major organ for the free trade uh, economists in, in the French-speaking world in 1844, and he becomes an instant celebrity because of this uh, extraordinary paper that he writes. He goes to Paris, um, uh, he overcomes all his prejudice about his clothes and his accent, he writes books about uh, the Corn Law League and Richard Cobden, he begins his pro uh, program of writing economic sophism to debunk the misperceptions that people have about free trade and other matters. He starts a Bordeaux free trade movement in 1846, and then one in Paris. He starts a magazine to uh, expound the views of the free trade movement. And then um, it all comes to an end in 1847 when the Chamber of Deputies refuses to uh, abolish trade restrictions in France. Then the 1848 revolution 
breaks, breaks out. And, and this is a picture of a barricade in the streets of Paris, and there are bloody bodies here because of the rioting and fighting that went on. And Bastiat's in the thick of this, as I said, you know, handing him little newspapers that he'd written. Um, he found a magazine called Jacques Bonhomme. Anyone know what Jacques Bonhomme means in French? A rough English translation would be Joe Sixpack. Right? This is Mr. Everyman, and he was writing propaganda um, for the average person, the average worker in the streets of France. He eventually becomes a, gets elected to the Constituent Assembly and begins his uh, com this, uh, combined program of writing serious articles and also serving in the chamber. He writes lots and lots of pamphlets and uh, begins to write his Economic Harmonies, which is his main work. He dies in, uh, on Christmas Eve, 1850, in Rome. Possibly he was suffering from tuberculosis, but what really killed him in the end was throat cancer. He complained about polyps in his throat, inability to swallow, excruciating pain. Um, and then his friends decide after his death to raise money and build this monument. And it didn't look like this as we see it today. This is what it looked like. There was this other bronze statue at the bottom, and this is um, the personification of fame. And she is writing on the marble plaque here the titles of his most famous books. Now, when the Nazis invaded France in 1940, after a couple of years, they decided to, that they had, were running short of metal, non-ferrous metals, to build their tanks and other war machinery. So they instructed the officials, uh, Nazi officials, to strip public monuments in France of all the bronze. So they locked off this uh, bus at the top and they broke Lady, the personification of fame, from the bottom, melted it down to make tanks. And of course, this is just a, a, such a terrible desecration because Bast one of the things that Bastiat was, was a strong anti-war advocate. And to think that his statues are being used to make Nazi tanks is just a horrifying thought. After World War II, they were able to find the mould to rebuild the bust at the top, but they never found the original mould for the statue. So that's now missing from the one that we can see today. And uh, I remember reading um, about a newspaper account about um, the celebrations. Um, apparently there were hundreds and hundreds of people in the town of Le and they'd come to, uh, to open this formally, and then they went to the local high school, and they had a big booze-up. And they described how there was drinking and singing in the streets until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Such was the celebration of this man's life. But I will say something about the kind of state that Bastia believed in. And it's very much in the tradition of the classical school, Adam Smith's notion of the limited government, where the government does only a few things. For example, police to protect property, defence to protect the nation from invasion, and some public goods. Now what they do is they dispute about how many uh, public goods should the state be involved in, should it be roads, should it be the postal service, should it be money, things like that. But this is basically what Rustiar believed in. You would call him a minarchist. Very limited, small, uh, cheap state. And if you look at this spectrum of state power, you can have, see the ultra state here, communism, where the, everything is controlled and owned by the state. And then right at the very end here, you could see the voluntary state where if anything exists in the state for the state to do, it's either privatised or it's abolished. <coughs> Bastiat is about here in the Munichus state, where he believes in some police, some defence, and a limited number of state-provided public goods. But that's it. Let me talk about uh, his notion about economic harmony, because this is one of the concepts that he's most famous for. Um, he had a big dispute with um, Carey, who was an, an American economist, who said, you've plagiarised all my stuff about harmony. And Bastiat said, no, I didn't. It was all inherent in, in, in the logic of what, how the market operates. And I thought of this a long time ago. And eventually they solved their dispute and they agreed that they had independently discovered this notion of uh, economic harmony. The underlying view is that the economy is this incredibly complex network of voluntary exchanges, which, if they're left undisturbed by government intervention, creates a harmonious, prosperous um, uh, economic system. And the thing that got Bastiat thinking about this was his visit to Paris, right? Here's a country bumpkin. Well, that's probably being a bit harsh. He was, you know, country magistrate, coming to a big, big city like Paris. And Paris was probably, at the time, the second largest city in Europe. About 750,000 people, 800,000 people. The really big metropolitan city of Europe at the time 
was London, which was two and a half million. So quite a bit bigger than Paris. But what Bastia observes about coming to Paris is the following. He said, on coming to Paris for a visit, I said to myself, here are a million human beings who would all die in a few days if supplies of all sorts did not flow into this great metropolis. It staggers the imagination to try to comprehend the vast multiplicity of objects that must pass through its gates tomorrow if its inhabitants are to be preserved from the horrors of famine, insurrection and pillage. And yet all are sleeping peacefully at this moment without being disturbed for a single instant by the idea of so frightful a prospect. On the other hand, 80 departments have worked today without cooperative planning or mutual arrangements to help keep Paris supplied. How does each succeeding day manage to bring to this gigantic market just what is, is necessary, neither too much nor too little? So what he's saying here is it's the self-interest of all the parties involved in these exchanges, whether it's the self-interest of the leek grower, who's providing leeks for the vegetable markets of Paris, or the consumer of leeks, who, wants to, who knows that they can go to the markets and find leeks always in, in, um, in, on the tables, ready to buy. He says that no one needs to plan this. It's the incentive, the, per, the private, personal uh, greed, if you like, of the seller and the buyer where these mutual exchanges uh, occur. And all of this doesn't have to be planned by a central planner. It's coordinated by pricing and having uh, uh, consumers who are interested in finding out where these products can be bought most cheaply and so on. He says, we do not need central planning. And of course, when you look at one of the central problems in the early 20th century was how do centrally planned socialist economies function? And of course, we have Hayek and Mises, Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises saying that there is no rational solution to this problem of deciding how to plan centrally an economy of one, you know, hundreds of millions of people and billions and billions of exchanges that go on every day. So Bastiat says there is no need for central planners. All we need is local knowledge by suppliers and, and consumers and the freedom to engage in trade. And this solves these problems immediately. Let me get on to some of his fallacies, which I think you'll find interesting. Bastiat had the notion that one reason why people didn't understand how the free market operated uh, and how or how free trade might operate was because they were being deceived. That there were all these misperceptions that were put out uh, to, if you like, confuse people. And the, these sophisms or these fallacies or these misunderstandings were driven by people who would benefit from various government interventions. For example, the manufacturing industry or interests that wanted tariffs to keep out cheap Belgian or cheap British uh, goods wanted to perpetuate these misunderstandings about the need for uh, protection of national industry. But really, Bastiat says, they're after their own self-interest. And they're cloaking their arguments in this argument about national interest or national benefit. And he said, it's up to us as a political economists to expose this selfish interest, to expose the inefficiencies and corruption of um, uh, government legislation and controls on, on economic activity. So some of the fallacies or sophisms that he was particularly interested in was the notion of things like the government, the government policy can increase national production and wealth through things like subsidies and protective tariffs. Or the government policy can increase the number of jobs through make-work schemes or what in France was the National Workshop, which appeared in um, February and March of 1848. The destruction of properties such as happens in natural disasters can lead to increased production and prosperity. And this was his famous broken window fellows. And of course, some of these economic fallacies you will immediately recognise as being still uh, perpetuated today. Um, if you go to my website, you'll see a link to this document here, which is an article by Walter Williams called Economic Lunacy. And he lists a number of economists who are arguing today that there might be a silver lining to the cloud, which was the uh, earthquake and tsunami in Japan, because it's going to lead to increased production. It's going to rebuild Japan so it's bigger and better than before. So this is a good thing. And Walter Williams is saying, where is Frederick Bastiat when we need him? Right, this is an, an economic fallacy was, which was debunked you know, back in the 1840s. Let me just give you a couple of examples of Bastiat's style. This is um, King Louis Philippe, who is, um, was the monarch 
in, in the July monarchy the, during the 1830s and 40s. And here's the sort of person that would be petitioned by people asking for state government subsidies and regulation in their favour. Um, and he was uh, unfortunately shaped physically so that all the cartoonists of the day drew him as a pear, a pear shape. And he hated that and used to imprison people uh, constantly for drawing him as a pair, uh, which only increased the number of people who would draw him as a pair. Um, but he's the sort of person who would be petitioned. And what Bastiat would do is he would take an argument that might be made, let's say, by um, a textile manufacturer who would go to him and say, Your Majesty, uh, we want to keep out uh, foreign uh, Belgian or British imports uh, because it's harming our business. And if you offer us protection, we can employ more Frenchmen. And taxes will be better for you because there'll be more industrial activity within France. So we're all going to win. And Bastiat would say, OK, let's take that argument and take it to an absurd degree to show the foolishness of this argument. So this is the reductio ad absurdum approach. And let me just give you an example. This is the Petition from the manufacturers of candles, tapers, lanterns, candlesticks, street lamps, snuffers and extinguishers, and from the producers of tallow, oil, resin, alcohol, and generally of everything connected with lighting, to the honourable members of the chambers of deputies. We are suffering from the ruinous competition of a foreign rival who apparently works under conditions so far superior to our own for the production of light that he is flooding the domestic market with this at an incredibly low price. For the moment he appears, our sales cease, all, all the consumers turn to him, and a branch of French industry, whose ramifications are innumerable, is all at once reduced to complete stagnation. This rival, which is none other than the sun, is waging war on us so mercilessly that we suspect he is being stirred up against, against us by perfidious Albion. That's British, uh, the British manufacturers. <laughs> Particularly because he has for that haughty island a respect he does not show for us. Like England is always cloud covered, so the sun never comes. <laughs> so that's Bastiat's little joke uh, about British climate. Um, we ask you to be so good as to pass a law requiring the closing of all windows, dormers, skylights, inside and outside shutters, curtains, casements, bullseyes, deadlights, and blinds. In short, all openings, holes, chinks, and fissures through which the light of the sun is wont to enter homes, to the detriment of the fair industries with which we are proud to say we have endowed the country. A country that cannot, without betraying, betraying gratitude, abandon us today to so unequal a combat. So what Vassar is saying that if the argument is logical in one case, why isn't it logical in the other? He says, well, it is logical, but it's absurd in both cases. And this is the style of argument that he, would, uh, that he developed and used so effectively. Let me try another one, uh, just to show you. This is his broken window fallacy. And he says that what happens is that, you know, uh, all economic consequences have, or economic activity has, complicated side effects. Some are immediately obvious, and he says everyone can see those. Others are more subtle, and they're not immediately apparent, and he calls these the unseen consequences, or the unintended consequences. And in the story of the broken window fallacy, he has our friend Jack, uh, Joe Sixpack, a glazier, and a shoemaker. And um, Jacques Bonhomme has the wi his window uh, broken, and so he has to have it repaired. So he, he decides he has to have it fixed, and he uh, asks the glazier to come and fix it. And so when, what is seen, you know, what can be measured and quantified, is that the glazier's business goes up, because he now has uh, the contract to replace Jacques Bonhomme's window. But Bastien says, well, what we don't see, or don't see immediately, but which clever economists can see because they've been trained to look beyond what is most immediate and obvious. He says, what is unseen is not only that Jacques Bonhomme is out of pocket, he spent something he, on, on, that he wouldn't have had to do ordinarily. If he didn't have to replace his window, what would he have spent his money on? Perhaps he would have bought a new pair of shoes. So what happened? The unseen consequence of the broken window is that the shoemaker doesn't get a sale. Jacques Bonhomme is out of pocket. He, um, he can't buy the new shoes he was planning to buy. The glazier who would have sold him the shoes is also out of pocket. And so Bastiat refers to this as the double incidence of loss. 
Right? For every obvious gain, that is of the glazier, there are at least two other people who lose out because of this catastrophe, this broken window. Now, of course, he didn't have the tools of modern uh, mathematics to go and explore what the ripple effect would be if you take this to the next level. You know, if, because the, um, the shoemaker didn't have a sale, what didn't he then spend his money on? It would have had an effect on the uh, person who sold chickens or something. Um, so there would have been this flow-on effect right through the economy. Now, one of the things that Bastiat was arguing about was that a number of French economists looked at the Great Fire of London of 1776 and said, isn't it amazing how London rebuilt itself after the Great Fire destroyed so much of the city of London? It showed enormous uh, productive activity. Everyone uh, pulled together and London was rebuilt bigger and better than ever before. And this is exactly what Walter Williams was arguing in his article about what people are now saying about Japan. Of course, the Great Fire of London and the uh, earthquake in Japan are, are catastrophes that will never really uh, be made up adequately, even over generations. And here's one of my favourite politicians. And he's busy knitting away creating new jobs. Isn't he industrious? Look how hard he's going. He's got so many done already. And it looks like he is actually doing something to create jobs. That is the scene, the obvious. What is not so obvious? <laughs> that his thread is tied to the shirt of the private sector who's losing it thread by thread. As fast as the barn was knitting, it's coming off his back. And so when you put the, uh, the two together, that's the part of it. And this is the classic example of the seen and the unseen. How can Barack Obama do anything when the government doesn't produce anything? It has to take money from the private sector to offer anything, whether it's Medicare or whether it's a, a job a provision of jobs. Um, it has to either tax people or regulate them or borrow, which means that it's paid for in the future by taxpayers. Let me um, go to some cartoons here. This notion of plunder, which is very important to Bastia. He said we all know about illegal plunder, that is when one person or group of people violate your property rights by stealing your property. This might be a thief, a burglar, a highwayman. It's quite clear the law is um, on your side. It's well understood that this is a, a violation of your property rights and it's punished and there are strong legal traditions to prevent this. But he said what happens if the constituted political authorities take your property without your permission and do so on a regular basis? Because he believes in natural rights and the natural right to own property, he thinks this is a form of legal plunder. The government takes your property without your permission. It is doing it to you exactly what the highwayman does to you when they take your property um, through a holder. And he says he wanted to write a history of plunder. And what he was interested in doing was looking at how over centuries organised groups have been able to control the state in order to undertake this um, policy of legal plunder. He wanted to write about slave owners and how they used the system uh, to legitimise slavery and to protect them in their ownership of slaves who were being used to provide um, goods and services um, uh, without permission, at the threat of force and violence. Uh, and he said this is one of the classic examples of legal plunder. And he said also as we go through history we can see how the organised Catholic Church in Europe, ruling elites who had uh, serfs and peasants, uh, aristocrats and others, also used the system to plunder the poor, plunder the weak um, over centuries in order, in order to get benefits uh, for themselves. He says, now we have a system which has evolved where privileged manufacturers can get special privileges and subsidies and tariffs and so on, also to plunder the uh, ordinary consumer. And he says, it's exactly the same thing as a... Morally, it's exactly the same thing as, as, a, as a high woman. So he talks about theft by subsidy, theft by customs duty. And war is the greatest example of legal plunder that there is in history. Now I can show you some very interesting cartoons. Here's one. Honoré <laughs> Dormier, who was a contemporary of Bastiat, did these wonderfully wicked and cruel uh, caricatures of the king. You'll see he's in the shape of a pear, um, <laughs> which he hated. And in fact, Dormier was sent to prison for two months uh, for doing <laughs> Here we have ordinary people lined up, paying their taxes to the state. 
and they're putting them in these baskets and these minions are carrying them up and putting them into the mouth of Louis Philippe and he's sitting on what is um, coyly called a commode <laughs> and um, falling out of the bottom of the commode are all these um, documents which are special privileges and subsidies for the elite who are then running through underneath here and grabbing them and then running off to the, um, to the Chamber of Deputies. So what he's saying here is that here are the taxpayers, the state as embodied by this pear-shaped uh, king is a tax eater. He eats our taxes and he gives them to, his, to the privileged few, his favourites, who are ripping off the taxpayers. So embodying a, in a, a cartoon form, um, the idea that Bastiat had about uh, how the state can be a, a, a legal plunderer. Here's another one. Um, this is another. This is uh, one of his <coughs> interesting examples of where he had public choice insights. He's quite advanced for his um, for the period, and he's beginning to see that um, bureaucrats and government officials are not the disinterested um, individuals that they might claim they are. That they do have selfish interests which they're trying to pursue through politics. And here we have, this is again our pear shaped um, king, and uh, he's meeting with his ministers, and they're all very happy and, and jovial and, and convivial. But what they're doing is they're picking each other's pockets. <coughs> right? There's rivalrous behaviour between these elite to try and get special benefits and privileges so they can uh, move ahead of the others. Um, and this was, you know, you can see there's another group here pickpocketing with each other and uh, uh, ingratiating and uh, doing all sorts of amazing things. In his stories, in his sophisms, he drew upon a huge reading that he had in, in French literature and popular culture. And he was able to draw upon these stories in order to turn them into what I call economic tales. And one of his favourites was La Fontaine. And La Fontaine used to write all these little fables and stories that some of you might have had read to you as a child. Um, they were a staple for um, English and uh, French speakers for, for a long time. And uh, one of the favourites that he uh, drew upon was this story of the weasel. And this is how he could take a very simple, ordinary moral story, or a story with a moral uh, purpose to it, and turn it into a, one with an economic and political moral. So Fontaine is writing in the 17th century, and um, this is the story of the greedy weasel, and he mentions this tale in the, in the, in the course of a, of a sophism, denouncing the pa increasing power of the military and how much of the budget is going to the military, and how they're consuming all these taxes, like tax eaters. And he says, um, this weasel, who could be a politician or a, a, a military vested interest, knows that the farmer has a granary which is full to the brim with grain. And the granary, in this case, is the taxpayers of France. When he decides to break into the granary, the weasel is quite thin. And this is the hole that he's able to squeeze through when he was thin and hungry. <laughs> he then comes through this hole, and as you can see, he's been eating his way through the granary in the storeroom. And now he is too fat to get back through the hole. So he's trapped. And a smart-ass mouse here is pointing out this folly, you know, that... The only way you can get out of this granary is if you go on a diet. If you stop eating all the farmer's um, produce, you might then eventually get thin enough to get back through the um, hole. If you don't, the angry farmer will come into the granary one day and perhaps kill you. So this is one of um, a very amusing way in which Bastiat would take simple literary stories and use them for his uh, economic purposes. Here's another one which is very amusing. Um, <clears throat> In France, there were these um, social clubs called goguettes. And because um, of the restrictions on political freedom of speech, there weren't political parties organised and, and, and there was very strict censorship of the press. People who wanted to talk about politics would go to these clubs, and not only would they drink, which is of course uh, coming up shortly, isn't it? Um, uh, but they would sing these political songs. And um, Bastiat knew these, and uh, in 1830, when the revolution broke out in France, yet again, um, Charles X was overthrown, and um, he was a, a fairly autocratic Bourbon, and Bourbon monarch, and he was replaced with a uh, Louis Philippe, a pear shaped chap, who promised a constitutional monarchy. And so the liberals of the day wanted to support 
a constitutional monarchy. But the garrisons of France were uh, divided to who was going to support who. Um, many of the soldiers felt they should support Charles X because he is the one to whom they had pledged, taken their oath of um, loyalty. And others were, were more sympathetic to the uh, constitutional monarchists. In Bayonne, where, uh, near where Bastia lived, the, 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 um, the garrison was split. And so Bastia, uh, as a young man, 29 or something like that, um, goes to visit the senior officers in the garrison and to persuade them to join with the constitutional monarchists, with the liberal forces. And he, he starts drinking with them and he starts singing some of these uh, political songs. And this is one that he probably sang with these officers and persuaded them to join the liberal monarchy of Louis Philippe and to abandon Charles X. And this was written by a gentleman called Pierre Jean Beranger. And he's mocking a local lord, a seigneur, who thought he was a jumped up Napoleon. And this is a thinly disguised criticism of Napoleon. And he, this, this jumped up seigneur begins to behave like an autocratic uh, king and begins to tax uh, his people. And this is one of the verses. Um, this is the song called The King Yves Tour of 1813. He says, uh, no, this is the song. I can't sing it, unfortunately, but uh, I'll just read it to you. After a drink? After a few drinks, yes, I'll sing it. Um, no costly regal tastes had he, save thirstiness alone. But before a people blessed can be, we must support the throne. So from each cask new tapped, he got his own tax gatherer on the spot, a pot. Ha ha, ho oh, oh, ha ha. And so they bang their glasses on the table and, you know, it's pretty <laughs> and then go on to the next verse. Um, so this is a song making fun of would-be Napoleons, the petty uh, local officials who uh, want to use the power of the state to increase their supply, in this case, of free beer. Another one is Molière, one of the great playwrights of um, 17th century France. And um, in one of Molière's plays, he has a parody. Um, where This is a play about a hypochondriac. And... Um, Molière thinks that most doctors are quacks and they, they should be mocked. And so he decides to, um, at the end of the play, one of the senior doctors decides to induce into the fraternity of doctors a young doctor, and he has to take this, he's blessed, in, and this is sort of like his oath of induction into the fraternity of doctors. And there's some um, pig Latin here and, and strange stuff. But the translation is this is, imagine, a, a senior doctor conducting a younger doctor into the fraternity, he says, I give and grant you power and authority to practice medicine, purge, bleed, stab, hack, slash and kill with impunity throughout the whole world. <laughs> and what Bastiat does is he takes this passage and says, hmm, what would a tax collector's oath look like? <laughs> so he writes his own pig Latin, and then his, um, his own little uh, induction oath, and you have to remember, this is a picture of Paris surrounded by toll rolls. Right? The tolls were charged to bring anything into the city and out of the city, and you had to go through one of these walls. And as the city of Paris grew over the centuries, the toll walls would, would expand. And the idea was that there were these various breaches in the walls, or gates, where a farmer would have to bring his produce to get into the city, into the markets, and that's where he would pay his taxes. And so you can imagine a tax collector at one of these gates um, and this is what, uh, if a new tax collector was inducted into the fraternity, a senior tax collector would say to him, I give to you and I grant virtue and power to steal, to plunder, to filch, to swindle, to defraud, at will, along this entire road. Now, in the spirit of um, Frederick Bastia, I wrote one of these for a TSA uh, official. <laughs> Which I won't tell you now, but I will tell you over a year after. <laughs> So I want to bring this to a conclusion and talk a little bit about some of the things that we might learn from reading Bastiat's material. And as I said, only half of it's ever been translated before, and we're going to produce a whole lot more. I think what Bastiat shows us is how important economics is, that it can explain so much of what we see around the world. But he would add a caution to this. He would say, um, it's not the only thing that explains how the world works, that we need a political philosophy, we need political theory, we need literature. Um, but economics has an enormous part to play in understanding how the world works. And he would say that 
So many of the problems in the world today are the result of bad economic policy. And it's, a, it's the role of political economists like him, perhaps like you, to expose bad economic policy. You know, who's benefiting from this? What are the consequences and costs of this bad economic policy? And what do we do to change things? And that's what, something that drove Bastia very much, was this uh, moral fervour and desire to make the world better for consumers. So he wanted to expose and debunk bad policies of what he called sophism, and he wrote hundreds of pages of these economic sophisms, which are very witty and clever. Something else here is that when you read about Bastiat, you think, my goodness, it's deja vu all over again, right? Things that he was struggling against in the 1840s uh, in favour of free trade and against economic uh, regulation and subsidies to industry is very similar to the problems that we face today, and he went through it all in the 1840s. So perhaps by reading his works, we can get some insight in how, why he succeeded or didn't succeed in what he was doing and what that might tell us uh, today. He also, I think, is very impressive in his how well read he was. Now, I'm not suggesting that you spend 20 years reading all the economic books that have written. That's possibly beyond um, any of our uh, capacities. But just to show that you know, he did study French, Italian, Spanish and English political economy in very great detail before he started to write. So the importance there of having a good grounding in the literature and being fluent with that and being able to argue. But also to be broadly read in other disciplines so you can draw upon, for example, La Fontaine's stories to try and make economic ideas more understandable to a general audience. Um, and finally, I would say things like his rhetoric of liberty I find extremely appealing. I do enjoy his attempts to make economics less dull and dry with his humour, with his stories, with his dialogues. Um, and I find it's endlessly amusing. His puns, which you have to understand the French to understand all the puns. But we try to explain some of those in the footnotes of our, of our volumes. Um, I think also say something, I'd like to say something about optimism and pessimism. That Bastiat was incredibly optimistic in the long run. He could see all the impediments in the short term, like the failure to get a free trade movement up and running in France, um, with the rise of socialism during the 1848 revolution um, and how that made it more difficult for him to uh, make his case. Um, his debilitating disease, which made it very hard for him to function. You know, he could not talk in the chamber of deputies at the end because of this uh, polyp in his throat. All he could do was write. And he kept writing this unfinished magnum opus right to the end, which I think is extremely uh, heroic. And I think also his sense of humour, mocking the follies of those in power, um, is something uh, commendable. Perhaps one final thing. This is my own attempt, a very weak attempt at humour. Um, some of you might have seen the Keynes and Hayek rap video. That's been a viral uh, YouTube thing. Um, this is a screen snapshot of it. But I decided that um, what would Bastiat do if he were alive today? What kind of video would he make for YouTube? I don't see him as a rapper. But I'll show you what I think he might be. I think, I think he'd be a rock and roller. And the only person I could find whose name was Freddie, because he'd have to call himself Freddie, is Freddie Mercury of Queen. So this is a picture of Queen singing a crazy little thing called Love. And I have quite rudely inserted um, Bastia's head on the top of Freddie Mercury's body. <laughs> And called his group Freddie and the Free Traders. And I'm sure he would be singing a song called Praise Little Thing Called Trade. But I thought also, uh, since we're in San Jose, he would also want to like, rewrite the tune of Bert Bacharach's Do You Know the Way to San Jose? And I would I change it to Do You Know the Way to Liberty. I can't get no liberation from the stones. <laughs> They say fair to the tune of the Beatles, let it be. And in fact, let it be is in fact quite a good translation of they say fair, if you know any French. Um, I'm a Led Zeppelin a supporter, Stairway to Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Beatles tax man, it needs no change in title. <laughs> so um, this is what Freddie Mercury really looks like. And this, this is his reincarnation as Freddie here last year. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Say anything about the, 
monetary system that was the background during Bastiat's period. I can see so many parallels which you have pointed out. However, the entire world is based on the fiat money now, and in his time, I think there was more of a commodity basis to the monetary system. Now, the question was about the monetary system during Bastiat's day. That's where Bastiat is doesn't really have much to say to modern economists because um, they did not have a paper-based currency, they did not have a fractional reserve banking system, it was still basically gold. And so um, it was not an issue. Taxation and trade were the issues rather than money. If you go back to the Napoleonic period, um, be because of the revolution in 1789 and the experiment with paper money then, the idea was that the new money that would be based upon, it would have as its backing assets the land that had been confiscated from the aristocrats and the church, and these were the assignats, and they had hyperinflation in the 1790s. Um, and because of that, the French were much more conservative than, let's say, the English. Uh, so during the Napoleonic Wars, England went off the gold standard just for a few years. And that's the background for David Ricardo's writing on the bullion question, because the question was, you know, when is it going to be returned, and what, what uh, exchange rate, and so on. And eventually they did go, go back on the, on the gold exchange. The French were much more cautious right through the Napoleonic period and never t uh, in, uh, uh, tried to set up the same kind of banking system that Brits had. Um, and so they actually got, had harder currency right through the war period and then into Bastiat's period. So the mod modern um, inflation and money theory, Bastiat really doesn't have anything to say to us. Yes. I know that uh, most libertarians today, if you were asked them uh, the state of the economy and of the state, would probably say it's pretty dismal. But if you're speaking on behalf of us, Joe, would you say today's society is freer than it was in 1848? Especially since there's more free trade, there's no slavery, things like that. I'd give you a simple answer and say yes and no. <laughs> um, on the very things that you said, our society is, is, is better. For example, the recognition of gay rights, of women's rights, the ending of slavery, all those things are um, huge improvements on, on Bastiat's day. Remember that slavery in France wasn't abolished until 1848 during the revolution. Uh, women in France had all sorts of repressive regulations against them, in spite of the fact that Napoleon introduced the civil code in 1804, um, that was a backward step for a lot of women who got freedom in the French Revolution. Um, but if you were single in France, you actually, had, as a woman, you had considerable freedom. You could sign contracts, you could own a business, and so on. Um, it's only when you got married that things went downhill, but they often go downhill for other reasons as well. Um, <laughs> but in terms of economic policy and the size and power of the state and the size and power of the military, Bastia would be absolutely shocked and horrified to see a modern state. Inconceivable to him. He was getting upset because of one or two early efforts to create a welfare state in France in early 1848. Just with one transfer payment um, policy, which was the national workshops. The idea was that the, uh, many of the socialists in the revolution promised the workers that we are going to create a new just society where you will get a uh, guaranteed um, uh, wages for your for working, and if you're not working, with the state will give you some kind of a job, a make-work job. And they calculated um, that there would be 15,000 unemployed Frenchmen, Parisians, who would qualify. Bastia said, no, no, this is crazy, you know, you're going to bankrupt the, uh, the new French state. By June, they had 200,000 people on, on the rolls. Right? They suddenly found all this unemployment that didn't, hadn't existed before. And it did bankrupt the French uh, government, and the system was closed down, which sparked the riots in June, where the troops were called out and they started shooting French rioters. And that was just one tiny little aspect of the, of the modern welfare state. And Bastiat found that scary enough. So what do you think of the modern French state? I, mean, I think you move immediately somewhere else. Um, where? Where? <laughs> Hong Kong, Singapore. <laughs> so, um, what do you think Bastiat, since we're Summoning Bastier now. I'm channeling him. Yeah, channeling him. Thank you. Uh, what do you think he would say uh, if he were in the U.S. and saw what was happening in Libya? So having this courage to fight for the masses who are being brutally oppressed, 
uh, and yet having the war resistance. I'm just curious. I mean, it, would, it, it seems like a contradiction uh, in him, and I don't know how he would resolve it. Well, I think the kind of mimicus that he was, he would say the best way to reduce conflict in the world is to restrict violent state activity to within its own borders. It's when governments start to go outside their own borders and interfere in other countries, that's when you get even greater problems. And we were talking about this earlier, about his idea, attitude towards Algeria, because um, in 1830, the French seized Algeria and eventually it became one of their colonies um, until the 1950s when they had this bloody civil war and revolution to um, get independence. And Bastiat was totally opposed to colonization and interference in other countries' affairs uh, on moral and economic grounds, and also on public choice grounds. He said the people who are in favor of the colonization of Algeria happen to be the bureaucracies in Paris who will see that their function is increased and that they'll have more jobs and they'll send people out to Algiers. And, and so he was um, opposed to, to that colonial adventure. I think had he, he lived through a time when there were other revolutions going on in the rest of Europe. Because uh, once the revolution broke out in Paris, it also broke out in the German states, it broke out in Vienna, it broke out in the Czech Republic, or the Czech regions, I should say, and uh, Hungary. And they were brutally put down by the Russian and Austrian armies. He never said that the French should be out there helping the Hungarians in their battle. He said, that's your problem. We have our own problems. And he was in the thick of it. What do you think about Libya? I don't know. Oh, you answer it. Yeah. Did, did you ask something? Yes, I'm wondering what you said he wasn't, his work wasn't popular until the very end of his life. I'm wondering, um, he's obviously become much more popular in fashion lately, but what was his effect in the next few decades after? That's a very good question. What was his effect? Um, he had a number of um, supporters who went on in, to work in the, in the French government. One of them was Michel Chevalier, and he when um, Bastiat didn't live to see this, but the next stage of the French Revolution was the coming to power of um, Napoleon III, who, became, who declared himself emperor in 1851. And um, he was a bit of a reformist, and he allowed into his government technocratic reformers like Michel Chevalier, who eventually persuaded him to sign a free trade treaty with England. So Richard Cobden, who'd been the driving force of the um, anti corn Law League in England during Bastiat's life, um, was still an influential person. In 1860, Chevalier, who had, who had become a disciple of Bastiat's and, and agreed with his free trade thinking, was, was uh, appointed by Napoleon III to sign a free trade treaty with Cobden, who represented the English government. And that treaty of 1860 began a whole series of bilateral free trade agreements between various European states. And that is a very important uh, phase in the opening up of all the European economies, the Western European economies, to, um, as their industrialization occurred, um, they were able to trade freely, more freely amongst themselves. Um, so in that sense, Bastia did have this sort of secondary effect. Um, after but the t trade and tariff wars broke out again in the late 19th century, where a lot of this was undone, and Bastia, had he lived to see this First World War, would have, I think, argued that that was perhaps an, an, an inevitable outcome of the trade wars that were occurring in the 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century. Um, but the very last edition of some of his works in French was, in fact, in 1914. Um, the the Guillaume publishing firm kept his works in print all through the 19th century. But from 1914 onwards, he was completely forgotten in France. Um, and it wasn't until the rebirth of sort of free market economic thinking in France in the 1970s and 1980s that some of those free market economists began to reprint some of Bastiat's essays. And the, the guy who's the general editor of our series, um, Jacques de Guénin, he's publishing in French at the same time a complete French language edition, which will be the first time <coughs> since the 1890s that his works have been available in a modern edition in France. But it's really strange. I mean, when I talk to French people, and 
they're not interested in the French classical liberal tradition. That's that's my research interest, which I've pursued for you know, 25 years, 30 years. And they don't know, and they're not interested in their classical liberal heritage, which I find very strange. Yes? <laughs> kind of two-part question. One, I wanted to ask you more about the Liberty Fund, because I just recently heard about yes. it. But also, the cartoon that you had up there about Obama kind of knitting away, creating jobs. Um, it, it's my theory, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it when you do that, it's not really a serious sum game. You're actually losing more jobs than when the government breaks jobs, right? Yeah, um, you're adding a layer of sophistication there that um, the cartoonist obviously can't go into. Um, <laughs> Bastia has these very funny um, stories. Um, when he was started his little magazine, you know, Jacques Bonhomme, and he was standing on... It's an interesting story. Um, the day after the revolution breaks out in Paris, in, um, on 24th of February, 1848, the young Gustave de Molinari comes to see Bastiat and says, we've got to do something. We've got to you know, get our word out onto the streets. And you know, we want to start a magazine. Can you be one of the editors? And Bastiat says, yes, yes, I'm happy to do that. And he said, but we have to do it legally. Um, there was a censorship law there where they had to get pre-censure approval. And so the way to do that was to take what you'd written to a censor in the town hall, the Hotel de Ville, and get a stamp. And they, so that Molinari and Bastiat and Coquelin go down to the Hotel de Ville. Uh, and it's in utter chaos. I mean, the revolution has just broken out. And there are ransacked offices and filing cabinets and people running up and down stairs with muskets and swords and so on. And Bastia says, hmm, well, we've tried to do the right thing. Obviously, the government's a bit preoccupied right now. Um, we'll, we'll just go ahead and get it printed. And um, they go to a number of printing shops, and the, uh, the printers aren't there because they're all out in the streets rioting. And they finally find a couple of printers, and one of them says, no, no, we're not going to print any of this uh, reactionary crap. You know, we're socialists. And eventually they find um, a print shop that's A, open, and B, you know, willing to print their stuff. And one of the things that they print are these little uh, articles um, explaining to people how they're being ripped off by the government. And one of them has a little story about a doctor, because um, Bastiat had read this uh, Moliere story. He says, the government is like a doctor who comes to see you every morning and you're sick, and he takes a loaf of bread from you, and then in the afternoon he comes to help you, and he breaks the bread in half and gives you half a loaf and says, this will help make you better. Right? And Bastia says that's exactly what the government does. It takes from you and then gives it back to you, but it takes your cut. It takes its cut. He thought it was about 50%. I don't know what you think the cut is of the government, but um, Bastia thought it was 50% or half a loaf. And then Liberty Fund. Liberty Fund. Um, Liberty Fund celebrated its 50th anniversary last year. It was founded in 1960 by an Indiana businessman, Pierre Goodrich, who was... Um, trained as a lawyer and a very successful lawyer and businessman who made squillions of dollars. Um, but he was also um, a fanatical reader, a bit like Bastiat, I suppose. And he read philosophy and economics and political theory. And uh, he was very concerned um, in the 1950s that people were no longer even talking about liberty and the issues that arise um, from that. And he decided he would pay people to come to conferences to talk about liberty. And so Liberty Fund began um, by organising these conferences to discuss, let's say, Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, and Goodrich was a good friend of Hayek at the time. Um, and that began our conference program, where we have 120 or 30 academic conferences a year where we pay academics to come to a hotel for a weekend and talk about a book or a person or an issue in a very intense, academic and friendly, open fashion. Uh, Liberty Fund also has a publishing program where we publish 10 or 12 books each year. And what we do is we select books that have gone out of print that we think should be in print because they maintain this conversation about liberty and books that no other publisher will touch. And we bring them back into print and they are beautifully built, made books, wonderful bindings, lovely print. Um, you just have to look at uh, you know, this one here to see the, the high quality. And this is $30.00 hardback, right, so we subsidise it. And then we have these, uh, a web uh, presence where um, we have two websites, the Library of Economics and Liberty, or EconLib, uh, which is devoted just to economics, where we have a blog, where we have um, 
podcasts and where we have an encyclopedia of economics online, which is uh, something I recommend to you um, as a useful resource. And then we have the Online Library of Liberty, which is what I'm in charge of, where that involves um, the rest of the humanities. And as Jack said earlier, we've won a number of awards for this. The most recent one was last year, the Library of Congress decided that our site was worth archiving. The argument being that because websites are so ephemeral, ephemeral, how will we know in 10 or 15 years' time what was on the web in the year 2010? Unless we archive them and sort of freeze them, make a copy of them. And we were honoured to be chosen as one of the couple of dozen sites the Library of Congress wanted to archive last year. But I get a lot of stick from my colleagues who say, why is it that the government keeps giving you these awards, like the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress? Don't they read what you have online <laughs> and what you want to do to these government subsidised educational programs? Maybe they don't read them. <laughs> okay, how about one more question? Go ahead. Oh, I wonder, maybe it's uh, like Zachary because social workers say, is it fresh off the free market system or capitalism? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Well, then maybe it's a side country be kind of like social welfare state. Is it fresh off the capitalism or free market system we run in the US? I mean, I talk about the federal bail program to the, to the street. Well, the reason it's side country be kind of social welfare state. Ah. Instead of the, you, you, mostly you try to allow them to provide everything. Is it fresh off the capitalism or free market system? Why, does France, why did France become a welfare state? Social welfare state, yeah. yeah. Um, this is part, of the, part of the fact is that there was criticism at the time of the First World War that the classical free market tradition had failed Europe because all its hopes for free trade and peace had broken down and war had broken out and that this meant that it was an obvious failure and that the new exciting um, ideologies of the future were social democracy or communism um, and that these, these ideologies would allow governments to plan and rationally organise um, their economies in a way that the chaotic free market could never do in the 19th century. And in a sense what we've had to go through is decades of experimentation where we now know from historical experience that centrally planned economies like the Soviet Union are just hopeless, hopeless failures. Um, that's one thing, um, that, that there was this possibility of a new way that had to be tried and that's been proven to be a false uh, track. A second thing is that all the countries that were involved in the Second World War on the victor's side, so countries like Great Britain and France and other European countries and then later on even uh, Germany, um, one of the conditions or one of the promises made to the millions of men and women who were involved in the war effort either as soldiers or working on the home front, was the promise that if you make these sacrifices to the state now, by serving in the army or working in the factories, we will provide you with health and education and welfare after the war. This is the price that we will pay you for the sacrifices that you're making in the 1940s. And that's how most of the modern European welfare states started. As an experiment after World War II, as sort of like payment for the sacrifices made during the war. And it's taken 40 or 50 years for this economic system to show that it is basically bankrupt. And we're seeing that now with the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. And it's even, of course, spread to um, the United States. Now, why this, whether or not France and Germany will see the light and say, well, we've tried um, socialism, we've tried welfare state, um, we've seen across the border, uh, central planning has failed. Whether they take the next step and say, well, we have to deregulate and go back to a free market, I don't know. Um, our job is to try and persuade them that the modern classical liberal tradition is worth looking at seriously. I see it in Roma, the socialist it totally fails in my economy. Yes. I see it in my own country. I don't like socialist in the country. It destroys everything. You know, people which are become full of people, and government take totally control. But that's when the five people are living in the country, that's totally destroy everything. That's the reason I, 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 I speak the reason. Okay.